Hello. Today's video looks at that enchantingly grubby character from Macbeth, the porter, who appears at the start of Act 2, Scene 3. Now, he speaks in prose as our porter. There's none of this iambic pentameter, ten beats a line for this lad. No, sir. And that prose reflects his low status in the social hierarchy. He's a working class boy. Now, the porter is a character drawn from medieval mystery plays, where you'd often have a gatekeeper to hell, letting in the sinners. And I tell you what, you take about the porter with a critical stick, you set about him with a critical stick, and you will find all sorts of interesting ideas and interpretations spill out. Now, the experts say that the play Macbeth is the source of the original knock-knock joke, as uttered by the porter. He says it twice, doesn't he? Knock-knock, who's there? Now, plenty of folk I know would say that's reason enough to despise the man. On top of the fact that the porter is, let's be honest, a, a grubby, drunken pervert. But I can't agree. To me, there's something seedily subversive about the porter that makes him most compelling. I mean, don't get me wrong, I wouldn't want to marry my sister. And, you know, in ten years' time, if my daughter drags home a degenerate like that, I'll be there on the doorstep cocking a shotgun. But like a lot of fictional characters, though they'd be repellent, in real life, they're enchanting in the literature, and the porter is no exception to that rule. One theory about the function of the porter is that he's there for comic relief. He's there to provide a break from the utter tension convention that's prevailed in previous scenes. I mean, we've had the build-up to this brutal, cowardly murder of Duncan, a much-loved king. And the aftermath, where like Beth and his wife fear exposure, at their most vulnerable, plastered in the king's blood. The porter scene, then, is Shakespeare's way of affording us, the audience, a little bit of breathing space, a little bit of light relief. And there is there's something very playful about the porter, isn't there? He's pretending, after all, to let in all these old sinners as the gatekeeper to hell. Also, he tosses out some sexual innuendo, which is a formal term uh, when you're communicating with the examiner to describe the willy gags or the penis jokes that the porter makes. He refers to a man drinking and he says a man is able to stand to and not stand to. This is a joke about the quality of a, a man's erection being affected by the amount of alcohol he drinks. My edition of Macbeth also says that the reference to the tailor roasting his goose uh, can be seen as a reference to an STD, a sexually transmitted disease. So this scene is a party bag of sexual innuendo. And Shakespeare was no fool. He knew that the groundlings, you know, the poor people standing in the pit paying their penny to watch the play, loved a bit of crude or rude humour. So he was very much tailoring his material to his audience. In fact, there's a line from Hamlet where he's talking about an audience and he says, uh, he's for a tale of bawdry or he sleeps. In other words, he's for a few willy gags, a few saucy tales, uh, or he, he switches off, he tunes out. So to keep the pit, the groundlings engaged, he needs to be laying on, trowling on, you might say, a few sexual innuendos. Though I dare say, although it was levelled at the pit, there's probably plenty of the upper class sniggering up their sleeves as well. Of course, if we want an examiner to sit up and take notice of us, we can slip in an alternative interpretation. So let's now challenge this idea of the porter as comic relief, as light-hearted badinage, and assert a counter-argument. Let's show that far from relieving the tension, the porter is in actual fact amplifying that atmosphere of anxiety, that sense of suspense. First of all, tail end of Act 2, Scene 2, just before the porter enters at the start of Act 2, Scene 3, you've got those big old knocks on the door. And if you're ever in a, a quiet, darkened theatre auditorium watching that play, and you hear these thonk, thonk, thonks come out of nowhere, it could put the fear of God up you. First time I saw it, I think I left a dent in the ceiling. Very, very powerful, maximises the tension. Those big knocks. Secondly, let's look at the language that the porter uses. Beelzebub, that's the devil. He refers to the devil again as well, doesn't he? Hell, hangings, the everlasting bonfire. This is pretty dark imagery. It's not exactly conducive to a lightening of mood. Finally, let's look at the structure of this play. Examiners love it when you can analyse structure. And in this instance, when I talk about structure, what I mean is how one section of the play links to another. The 
tail end of Act 2, Scene 2, Macbeth, plastered in the king's blood. Anybody was to come upon him now, he would literally be caught red-handed. And that knocking spells exposure to him. You let him in, you find Macbeth, before he's a chance to change and wash away that evidence. But the porter, this buffoon, this idiot, is messing about. He's delaying the opening of the gate. And as an audience, we can feel very anxious to think of this porter squandering opportunity to catch Macbeth before he's a chance to change. As an actor or a director, then, there's plenty of compelling evidence for both sides of the argument. You can either play the porter as comic relief or as a tool to ratchet up the tension a few more levels. I've even seen productions where they mix it up a bit and you see a little bit of relief and a little bit of sinister anxiety building intent as well. And in fact, the gold standard, I think he's on YouTube, is a chap called Ian McDermid. Um, if you're a Star Wars buff, he played Emperor Palpatine. Ian McDermid does a wonderful performance of the porter. Uh, he's got this kind of scruffy, feral, guttural Scotsman vibe about him. I mean, even when he talks about the English tailor, he spits at the word English. And it's a masterful balance between sinister and comical. Well worth checking out. So far then, we've looked at the porter in pretty basic terms, either as a dramatic device to ratchet up tension or to relieve it. But I believe there's more to the porter than that. Because the porter's patter, the porter's dialogue, can be seen, can be interpreted as commenting on key themes and characters in the play. This whole joke of him being the porter of Hellgate. What does this suggest? I'd say this is a sort of metaphor. He's presenting Macbeth's house, Macbeth's castle, as hell. A fantastic way of telegraphing to the audience the depth of Macbeth's depravity. It conveys the evil of Macbeth's actions, that regicide. You've got the other reference to uh, a farmer who hanged himself on expectation of plenty. To me, this foreshadows the death of Lady Macbeth. She too commits suicide because she expected to take the crown and everything to be wonderful, and it didn't work out that way. That expectation of plenty that she confidently predicted did not pan out the way she intended, and she takes her own life as a consequence. We've also got the reference to the equivocator, and deception which is what equivocation means, deception or using unclear language, is a key theme to this play. The witches use it, don't they? Fair is foul and foul is fair. The ambiguous, unclear promises that they make to Macbeth. Deception, a key theme. Equivocation as well might be a topical reference. There was a chap involved in the, uh, the gunpowder plot. I think he was called Henry Garnett. He was a Jesuit priest. and He tried to equivocate or use unclear language when he was in court, rather than tell a, a lie, because of course he was a man of cloth, he was a religious man, uh, in the hopes of dodging the hangman. Didn't work, he got executed with the rest of the plotters. So that reference to an equivocator who could not equivocate to heaven, perhaps a reference to Henry Garnett, this gunpowder plot associate. Then we've got the tailor. What's this about? The tailor who stole some fabric, he stole out of a French hose, French pair of trousers. I think this is a clever way of just suggesting how squalid and grubby Macbeth's crime is. To put it on the same level as somebody sneaking a bit of fabric. It's, it's theft. It's theft of a crown. It's theft of some fabric. It certainly robs Macbeth of any nobility in his aspiration. He's no better than a common criminal. And of course, like the common criminal, hell has no distinctions. It doesn't matter if you nick a penny or a pound, that's where you're going, so says the Bible. So Macbeth, clearly destined for the fires of hell. Even the sex jokes, you know, that, that stuff about the, uh, the erection standing to and not stand to, perhaps this relates to Macbeth's anxieties about masculinity. You know, Lady Macbeth's always needling him to prove that he's a man. Maybe it's an oblique reference to that theme as well. So a lot more to the port then than just this uh, trick for cranking up or dialing down the tension. And I love the porter's metaphor for the attractive qualities of sinful behaviour. 
he talks about people going the primrose way to the everlasting bonfire. Let's think about a few examples of sinful behaviour, shall we? Cain in 10 Big Macs, drinking 20 pints and puking on his shoes, having the affair with your secretary, stealing something that you really want, that you've really coveted, that isn't actually yours. I'm sure when you're doing these things, it feels fantastic. But of course, you are deferring payment. That payment being a permanent stay in the fiery pits of hell. So saith the Bible. And clearly, this idea of the primrose way to the everlasting bonfire has parallels with the actions of the Macbeths. They were achieving their dream. Securing that high status, the crown, the throne. That to them is a primrose way. It was an attractive prospect. But ultimately, that sinful behaviour is going to damn their souls to hell and ensure that they wind up facing the business end of the devil's prom. When the porter opens the door to Macduff, he says to him, I pray you, remember the porter. And I've said before, the examiner loves it when you can extract a double meaning from a piece of evidence. I think we can do it here. I pray you, remember the porter. On the surface, the basic meaning is, can I have a tip, please? He's asking for some money. The alternative, the double or the deeper meaning to this line, I pray you remember the porter, is mark my words well. Listen to what I am saying as the porter because I am giving deep insight into character and theme in this text. I'm also foreshadowing what is going to happen in this text. So you do well to remember my words. And going back to the great Ian McDermott who played the porter, uh, when he utters this line, he milks a bit of comedy from it because he pokes his little cheeky rat head out the door and he says to Macduff, I pray that you remember the porter. And of course, he spent a good time getting to the door. It's a bit ironic, a bit cheeky that he's asking for money. And uh, Macduff actually gets him in a headlock to tell him how annoyed he is that this joke has kept him waiting. To conclude then, Shakespeare is employing the porter as comic relief, diffusing the tension after that suspenseful build-up to Duncan's murder and its immediate aftermath. And uh, how he generates that comic relief is through humorous comment on excessive drinking, he's pretending to be the gatekeeper from hell, and of course he's throwing in those willy gags, that sexual innuendo. The alternative interpretation, which will rock the examiner's world, is that we can read the porter as compounding or adding to that sense of tension uh, that's been fostered or grown in previous scenes. I mean, after all, is delaying opening the gate means Macbeth is time to wash incriminating blood streaks off his hands. Also, you've got that hellish imagery, haven't you? Beelzebub, the devil, hell. That's clearly more aligned to uh, creating tension than alleviating it, lightening the mood. In his play acting as Hell's Gatekeeper, his comments are significant. He's casting the Macbeth's deeds in a very negative light, emphasising the severity of the couple's crimes. Also, you've got references to equivocation, which highlights you know, the, the play's theme of deception. Finally, you've got the idea that the porter's words foreshadow the end of the play, when the Macbeths pay for their crimes with their lives. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, he's a sex-obsessed, heavy-drinking loser, but, as he says himself, you would do well to remember the porter.